So this summer, we're looking at various passages, partly following on from what God's been saying to us about prayer, partly laying a foundation through uh, to what we want to be doing in the autumn. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm not quite sure what to pray for. I mean, I can think of enough things I need, and I can think of people to pray for, but it, it feels sometimes a bit repetitive if that's all I'm doing. I don't know whether anybody else has the same problem. Oh, thank you, Micah. At least one person does. And, and finding how to make my prayer life really meaningful and powerful. And I'm just going to saying we're going to look at this theme of prayer what's, and power. What sort of power? What is the power for? How do we experience it? And it's interesting, the context is exactly what we've just been praying for. The context is the glory of God. That's what Paul has spent three chapters talking about. And he, and he sort of ends by saying, when I think of the greatness of this incredible plan of salvation for the whole creation, I get on my knees and pray to the Father. So this is part of something enormous, world-changing. So first of all, what, what sort of power is Paul talking about? Well, he tells us. It's an incomparably great power. Well, that's quite a lot, really, for starters, isn't it? It's, it's a great power that you can't compare with anything else. He says it's like the working of his mighty strength when he exerted in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. How much power does it take to raise someone from the dead, do you think? How much power does it take to raise someone from the dead who has been whipped and crucified. How much power does it take to raise someone from the dead who has just fought and defeated sin and death and the devil? And how much power does it take to roll a stone away? That's a lot of power. That's a lot of power we're talking about. It's out of his glorious riches, Paul tells us, that this power comes. In other words, if you can imagine the best of heaven, which we struggle obviously to do, but all of its glory and beauty and riches that's the sort of power we're talking about I once had the privilege of visiting Niagara Falls I don't know has anyone else been to Niagara Falls but good I recommend it and at one point you can walk into a sort of walkway at halfway underneath the falls the, the rock is one side of you the water falls the other side of you and it is a torrent it is huge. It, the noise, the spray, you, you can hardly even think of the power that comes over those falls. And of course, that's nothing really compared with the incomparably great power that we're talking about today. The word is dunamis. And preachers will often say we get the word dynamite from it. Well, we do, but of course they didn't have dynamite in those days. So when they used the word dunamis, they were talking about a group of oxen pulling a plough through heavy soil, doing something that a man couldn't do on his own. And they'd be talking about a boat with a whole row of rowers on each side when there's no wind, rowing. They're talking about a strong, consistent, relentless, determined power. That's what we're seeing here. Not a flesh in the pan. And Paul is aware that to live the Christian life, we can't do it on our own. We need more than our own ability. A number of you will know, having come to our house, we have a fairly sizable lawn, which is lovely, but lawns need cutting. So a number of years ago, I bought a lawnmower, and I had a choice. I could buy one that you just push, or I could buy one that's power-assisted. Now, I thought I needed the exercise, so at that point, I bought one that you can only push. There's no power in it. I regret that a bit now, <laughs> as life has gone on. It'd be nice to have a power-assisted one. But that's not a bad analogy of our Christian life. We could be trying to mow the lawn in our own effort, or we could be using a power-assisted mower. You still have to direct it. You still have to turn it on. It doesn't happen automatically, but power kicks in when you start mowing, which sadly with mine, it doesn't. I just have to keep pushing. So that's what this power is for. It's to enable us to live the Christian life together. It's a Holy Spirit, power-anisted life. What is this 
power for, according to Paul? Well, <clears throat> surprisingly, it is not for miracles, or not in this passage. It's not for great breakthroughs. It's not for providing what we need in life. It's not for signs and wonders and evangelism. What is it for? It's for two things. It's firstly to make us more like Jesus from the inside out. That's the key. It's to make us more like Jesus from the inside out. And secondly, this power is to help us to grasp more of his enormous love for us, which we touched on this morning in our worship. That's what Paul says, this Niagara-like water cascading power is for, to make us more like Jesus from the inside out and to also enable us to somehow get a hold of this incredible love which transforms our lives. So firstly he talks about strength and power in the inner man. It's the same as 2 Corinthians 4 where he says actually outwardly we're wasting away. Some of us are more aware of that than others. Yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. It's that inner renewing. It's what is left when all the outward wastes away. Or as a friend used to say, it's what happens when you squeeze something. If you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. When our lives are squeezed by circumstances, what comes out is our inner person, our character, our motivations, our desires. What happens when you are squeezed is your inner man. And we live in a day where, as Pete was praying, the, the, the outward is massively overvalued, isn't it? Everything is about health, fitness, beauty, strength. It's all outward. It's about exercise and diet. So much of people's time and energy and money is focused on how we look outward, isn't it? So little is focused on how we are inward. We see it in politics. We see it in social media. And instead of all this outward focus, we're encouraged to cultivate the unfading beauty of a quiet and gentle spirit. When did you last hear an influencer talk about the unfading beauty of a quiet and gentle spirit? We're, there's being formed in us integrity, there's being formed in us faithfulness, there's being formed in us peace. This is what the inner person is all about. Compassion. There's a word for it that is often used. It is sanctification, the process which we become more like Jesus. It's not a word you hear very often nowadays, but it is a fundamental truth of what's happening to you and to me. The moment we come to Jesus, that we acknowledge our failure to live up even to our own standards, let alone his, that we come and repent and say we're sorry for our sins, and come and say, I accept you, Jesus. I accept you pay the price for those things. And more than that, you want to give me righteousness. You justify me. My relationship with my creator is restored. That all happens when you come to Jesus and meet him personally. And if you haven't done that yourself, I encourage you, talk to somebody afterwards. That transforms not just this life, but eternity. But that is only one part of the story one part of the gospel. The other part is this process of what we call sanctification, of, of being turned into more like Jesus. You see, the, the image of God is still drawn imperfectly in you and me. And God, through his spirit, is continually refining and restoring the image of who he is. He says, be holy as I am holy. And he's drawing it in more lively colors. If you want to follow this up and this preach more, D.A. Carson wrote an excellent book called Spiritual Reformation, which I've taken some of this from, where he looks at the prayers of Paul. And he has this really good analogy. That when we're saved, when we meet Jesus for the first time, we're a bit like a shabby, run-down house. There are bits where it leaks in the roof. There are bits where some of the windows may be broken. There could be maybe a little bit of rubbish 
in some of the corners, the, the wallpaper is peeling. From a distance it might look great, but if someone looked at our life close to, and if we looked at it as we know it, we would see all those bits in the shabby house. So what happens in sanctification? Well really simply it's the process by which the house is restored, by which the leaks are gradually covered over, by which the windows are replaced by which the rubbish of bad habits is cleared away, all in the power that we're looking at here. And it includes extensions. God may want to put an extension, put more things into our lives. He want to repaper the walls. And why is this? What well, it's so Jesus can be at home in our hearts. Isn't that amazing? He wants to be at home. When we, when we come to him, he, he comes into us but it comes initially as a visitor it's up to us how much we invite him to stay and he could come as, as, a, as a guest as a friend and that was nice there's a relationship start but you know he, he wants to come as a he wants to come to a place where he feels completely at home that's the journey you and I are on that our lives inside get cleaned up, restored, redecorated with beautiful things. So that Jesus would say, I'm comfortable here. I'm at home here. You know, the, you know those lovely saintly older people? Which I was one. Who you look at and you just see Jesus shining. Up. That's because he's at home there. Because they've allowed this process, this power, to slowly change them from the inside out. The old Puritans used to grasp this. Let me read just a few of this. It's a slightly but beautifully This is Thomas Watson. He says he not only washes away sin, but he cleanses us with purity. Sanctification is heaven begun in the soul. I love that. Begun in the soul. A sanctified person bears not only God's name, but increasingly his image. It is a beautiful thing. It makes God an angel. I'm still trying to get my head around that. But the sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, somehow makes God an angel fall in love with us. Holiness is the most sparkling jewel in the Godhead. The Spirit of God in a man or woman purifies them, perfumes them with holiness, and makes their heart a map to heaven. You want to be perfumed with holiness. We don't talk about this very much, I don't think, in our instant world. But isn't it beautiful when we do start talking about it, how God wants to perfume us with holiness? What does this look like in practice? I encourage you to read Colossians 3, verses 5 to 17, where Paul explains what this looks like in practice. He says, he talks about putting to death things like greed, impurity, anger, lying. He talks about putting on things like compassion, kindness, gentleness. That sort of puts the flesh on what this is going to look like for you and me. All done from the inside out by the Spirit's power. For it's God who works in us to work and to will according to his good purpose. This is a combination it's a radical, breathtaking thing that God wants to do in our lives. We need to cooperate with him, but it's his power that does it. In a previous career, I used to have fun blowing things up. It was legitimate, it was allowed, okay? What we learned fairly quickly, if you wanted to blow up a rock to get it out of the way, it was no good taking your plastic explosives and your detonator and your deck cord and sticking it on the rock and firing it. All that happened was a massive, big flash and a bang, and the rock was still there. If you wanted to shift the rock, you had to do something first. You had to drill holes in it, which took time and effort. And then you pushed in your plastic explosives, you put in your detonator and your deck cord, you lit it, and you didn't run, you weren't allowed to run, you walked very slowly back to where your protection was. When the explosion went off, the rock would be split, and it would then be easy to move. Now, drilling the holes did nothing, really. 
you know, if you didn't put an explosive in, drilling the hole is utterly useless, rock's still there. But if you didn't drill the holes, all the power in the world wasn't going to shift that rock. So this is how we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. It is his power that transforms us. But we need to drill the holes. It's our, the way we walk with Jesus, we'll talk about it a bit more in a minute, that enables the holes to be drilled. For this amazing power to be working in your life and my life. Because the world misunderstands this so badly. Christianity is not a moral code. It is not about a set of rules of what is right and wrong. It's not about coming to God and trying to be a good person. That is not Christianity. That is religion. Christianity, following Jesus, is a powerful, undeserved, breathtakingly beautiful relationship which changes us from the inside out so that we do all these things and far more anyway. But it's nothing to do with following rules. It's all to do with the power of God that Paul is praying for. So that's the first thing that he prays for and encourages us to pray for. The second thing, which is equally critical to our everyday lives, is what? What does he pray for? Just check you with me. What does he pray for? Power to a bit louder, power to... We better get the passage back up. <laughs> power to grasp the love of Christ and to know it in great measure. He's already said earlier on, you're rooted and established in love. So in other words, the love of Christ is in us. We know the love of Christ. Otherwise, we haven't been saved. That is the foundation. But what he's saying here is there is so much more to grasp. And in grasping it, and we sang it again this morning, it transforms how we see our challenges, it transforms how we see our lives, it transforms how we see our potential. Because the love of Christ becomes bigger and bigger in our lives. It's about knowing it experientially. Paul struggles to express this. So he uses these four words. He talks about the breadth. In other words, love of Christ affects, empowers, changes every area of our lives. Our families, our work, our relationships, our dreams. The love of Christ is the foundation for all of these things to be different. The breadth is bigger than we can imagine. What about the length? Well, that says to me, the love of Christ was there when you and I were conceived in the womb, through to the day we die, and beyond. It's right from beginning to end. You may have had really difficult things happen in your lives, many of us have had, but the love of Christ was there. We may not understand it, but the love of Christ is, is long. It covers beginning, to end. If you have had things like that, maybe you should ask someone, and you feel they're still profoundly affecting you, ask someone else to help pray with you. And gradually, over a period of time, the love of Christ can change how you feel about that experience, because it is long. It is also deep. It reaches to the deepest parts of us, the bits we're ashamed of, the bits we don't even know about ourselves. The love of Christ goes under them and brings them up and supports them. There's nothing in your life that you're ashamed of or frightened of that the love of Christ isn't bigger than, because it's deep. And finally, it's high. His desires, his plans for us, are greater than anything we could imagine, because the love of Christ is high. It has a height to it. Does that help to begin to grasp it? I mean, as Paul goes on to say, it's beyond knowledge. <laughs> if Paul, the most anointed and greatest preacher and teacher in the history of Christendom, cannot describe it, I'm not going to attempt to. But it is always a journey to go further and further and further in. I just love Galatians 2 verse 20. The Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. That to me is really helpful measurement. Jesus gave himself for me. His life, his death, everything. If you are giving yourself to somebody, 
however much we do it it's incomplete Jesus gave himself completely for you and for me and there is a power to help us know this in fact we can't do it without the power you could read and study it without this power but we wouldn't get very far we need the power of God to grasp the love of God in Jude 21 it says keep yourself in the love of God it's a great piece of biblical advice as we go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday into our week keep yourself in the love of God and ask for his power to grasp it more fully it's interesting he also says in this passage together with all the saints this is not something we grasp on our own this is not a mystic experience you can go away and study and learn on our own no we grasp this together with all the saints John Stott said it takes the whole people of God to understand the whole love of God it takes people of God to understand the whole love of God I had an example of this recently we have a close friend who's on a journey with cancer and it's been a roller coaster in that um, she thought the treatment was working and then they said it wasn't um, and then they said there may be a possibility of another new trial that would help um, solve it and then suddenly out of nowhere that was all built up ready to start and then that crashed um, a couple of weeks ago and she got up on Sunday and just talked about the love of God not, not talking about her situation just, just marvelling and wondering about the love of God and I, I learnt from her and knowing her and her life more about the breadth of the love of God as I listened to her we need the whole church of God to understand the whole love of God so lastly practically how, how does this work? How do we know the power that makes us more like Jesus from the inside out? It enables us to experience and live from a greater awareness and understanding of his love. Well, it's pretty obvious really, isn't it? We pray. That's what Paul says. This is one of the things he mainly prayed for everybody else. So it's a pretty good tip. Let's pray for ourselves. Let's pray with devotion as it talks about chapter 113 the early church pray with devotion get hold of this verse write it out pray it consistently continually let's pray rooted in scripture that gives that gives edge to our prayers gives content to our prayers just as like this passage does read scripture meditate on it memorize it that will deepen our praying we'll know more of this power do it in faith expect something to happen I think I've been on a bit of journey of prayer and I've made a bit of progress even in this last year. It's hard when you keep praying for things and they don't change, isn't it? And you wonder what's going on, you wonder whether it makes a difference. I think, uh, and this is just the grace of God, I, I think I've just come to the point where I just know that every prayer makes a difference. I just know, they all do. They all make a difference. I mean, they must do, aren't they? Because God's our Father and He's listening. We may not see the difference. <laughs> And somehow it sometimes seems to need a lot of prayers before the scale tips. But every one counts. And I just feel that now. It's, I find it enormously helpful in my praying. <laughs> praying for things that feel a bit stuck. Uh, and I pray and nothing happens. It's all right. It's one prayer closer. There's this picture in Revelation about the prayers of the saints filling a bowl. A bowl of incense. And I think it's what they're doing. They're filling a bowl. They're like on a scales. I'm sure this is an inadequate analogy but it helps me they're on the scales gradually and at one point something's going to tip I don't know when but every prayer counts so pray expectantly pray filled with the Holy Spirit in Galatians it says walk with the Spirit the Spirit empowers these prayers so just to end why does this matter so much why are we looking at this well, Paul is very clear about the ultimate purpose for this prayer. And you know, it's not about our goodness. Nor is it primarily to help us to be our authentic selves, whatever that might be. I want to be my authentic self, to be honest, to rather become more like Jesus. Nor is it for our health, nor is it even really for our self-improvement. So much of, of stuff tends to be now about self-improvement. All of these things may happen, but that's not what it's for. It's for what we prayed for 
at the end of our worship. It is for the glory of God in the church and in Christ Jesus. That is what this prayer is for. Because as we become more like him, God is glorified in this church and in this nation. As we become more caught up in, empowered by the love of Christ, God is glorified in this church and in this nation. This prayer is a big prayer. It's a prayer for the glory of God. It's interesting. Paul says, it's in the church that God's glory is shown, and it's in Jesus being proclaimed. That's our heart, isn't it? So it's amazing. I didn't know we would pray that at the end, but this ends up just where we were a few minutes ago. This ends up saying, it's a big prayer. It's a prayer that the glory of God is going to be known in us because there is an amazing power available. Not just strength, but power to live gradually, stage by stage, day by day, increasingly beautiful lives, increasingly full of the love of Jesus. I think that's amazing.